ask you please to turn in God's Word to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and also to Isaiah chapter 1. And we're going to be reading just a few verses out of Genesis then moving to the book of Isaiah. So Genesis chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 1. In the will of the Lord over the next number of weeks, uh, months, uh, I want to go through the Word of God, and I want to take each service that I preach at, I want to take a book of the Bible just in the order they come. Tonight we're going to be speaking on the book of Genesis, do an overview, what are the main themes, and then preach uh, from the book of Genesis. Next Sunday morning, in the will of the Lord in the book of Exodus, and then continuing on as I preach, going through the books of the Bible, taking one book each week and doing an overview of that book. And there are various reasons for this. It's important that we look at the Bible as a whole. Uh, Some people read the Bible, but there are certain parts they just leave because maybe they don't understand. Maybe they're difficult. Uh, Maybe they're not very familiar with them and they're just left aside. But I would encourage you as we do this to read the passages that we have been studying. So this week, I would encourage you to go and read the book of Genesis and to take time this week and to sit down and read through this book concerning what we have studied or will study tonight in this meeting and pray that the Lord will bless it to your soul. And in the will of the Lord, when we get to the book of Revelation, we will have done an overview of God's Word. We'll see how it all relates together, how it all presents Christ, and how it's all profitable for our soul. And therefore, we start at the beginning tonight here in the book of Genesis. And I want to read the first five verses of the book of Genesis and then go over to Isaiah chapter 1, because I'm sure you know that Isaiah has been called the mini Bible. And each of the 66 chapters refer or relate in some measure to the 66 books of the Bible. And therefore, Genesis chapter 1, or Isaiah chapter 1 relates to the book of Genesis, Isaiah chapter 2 to the book of Exodus. And we'll see that as we study throughout this year in the will of the Lord. So let's read the first uh, five books here, five verses here of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning where the first day. And then let's turn over to the book of Genesis and read a portion of this book, for, or Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Josiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Uh, ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even onto the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, 
as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. And then verse number 16, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, ye shall eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with a sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And finally, verse number 28. And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. Amen. Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 1. And Robert Murray McShane once said, uh, when you're reading a book in a dark room and come to a difficult part, you go to the window to get more light. And so we ought to take our Bibles to Christ that he might shine the light upon the word and our understanding. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, We're going to pray and ask for the Lord's blessing upon this word tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge tonight in the name of our Savior that the words that we have read are thy words. Lord, they are not the words of man, but they are the words of God. And therefore, Lord, we must treat them with reverence and with respect. Lord, we must heed them diligently and carefully. I pray, O Lord, that thou wilt give me thy help by thy Holy Spirit to handle thy word carefully tonight and to be faithful to thy word. Help me not to err, but help me, Lord, to truthfully proclaim what thy word does declare. I ask thee, Lord, tonight that thou wilt encourage God's people as we consider this book, the book of beginnings, that, Lord, thou wilt remind us Lord, that thou wert in the beginning. And Lord, the only reason that we're sitting here tonight is because in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And Lord, we thank thee for what thou hast done in creation. But Lord, we also thank thee for what thou hast done in salvation. And Lord, we thank thee that even in this book we'll see tonight that the promise of our Savior is found. Oh Lord, I pray tonight that if there are those in this meeting who are not saved, they'll find the Savior. O Lord, I pray that they will see that the God who created heaven and earth is also the God of redemption. O Lord, I pray tonight they'll see their need. and They'll bow the knee in repentance. And they'll come and put their faith and their trust in the one true God of heaven and earth. Thank thee, Lord, for the way that's been opened for sinful man to approach a holy God. We pray tonight, Lord, you'll apply this specifically to hearts in this meeting. And Lord, empty me of self and sin. Fill me with thy spirit, Lord, how I need thy help tonight. And Lord, I pray thou wilt equip me and give me the ability to deliver thy word to the glory of thy precious name. For it's in Christ's name I ask these things for his glory. Amen and amen. The word Genesis is actually a Greek word. And it means origin, source, or beginning. We get the word genetics or generations from it. It's taken from the meaning of the very first word in the Hebrew Bible, and that first word means in the beginning. It literally is the first three words of Scripture. Now, when we come to the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, Judaism and Christianity have always attributed these books to the authorship of Moses. Now, when you think about that, that's quite strange because Moses wasn't born until after the events of the book of Genesis took place. So how do we know that he was the author of the book? Well, we are reminded in the word of God in 1 Kings chapter 2 verse 3 about the law of Moses. And that word law refers to the first five books of the Bible. That was the word of God. That was the law of God that had been given. And David spoke about it being given through Moses. 
We also find that the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament said that there was the book of Moses, and in that he was speaking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So the Lord authenticated that. And we must remember that the Bible tells us that prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And therefore, Moses was given this word. This is God's word. And as it has been recorded carefully then and preserved up to now, here we have God's account. God's account of the beginning of all things. There are many people today, and they give man's account. They give man's theories. But here we come to God's account. God was there. And it's declared in his word, in the beginning, God. And I want us to look at four simple subjects tonight in the book of Genesis that I hope will give us an understanding of the book. And the main theme of this book is beginnings. Beginnings, the beginning of everything. The beginning of everything we know today, even in modern society. So that's the first thought, in the beginning. And this shows us God's power. Why do we have marriages? Why do we have right and wrong? Why do we have a standard of morality? Because when God created the world, he also gave to that creation his standards and his rules for human life and behavior. Now, there are places where these standards are held, and for many years and in many lands, they're held as the standards for absolute right and absolute wrong. They make up the very foundations of many of the laws of our country. They have been the measure by which society is regulated and ruled by. How do we know that something's right or wrong? We, we know it from God's word. Because it's God's standards. But I don't need to tell you today that these standards are under attack. The world today would seek to say, you know, there's no absolute right and there's no absolute wrong. If it feels okay, well, sure, it is okay. If you can do it, why not do it? You can't tell me I'm wrong because who are you to say what's right and what's wrong? And we find that those are the type of things that are being said today and laws and standards are being changed, not to suit the word of God, but to suit society and the opinions of men. That's a very dangerous thing. That's a very dangerous thing because it means then that the most vocal people will be those who are able to dictate what is right and what is wrong. And we have found in our land today that it is the ungodly who are dictating what is right and what is wrong. And the word of God tells us, woe to them that call evil good and good evil. And we're living in those days. Whenever you seek to do good, you hear it being called evil. And whenever you seek to call evil and sin for what it is, there's a multitude out there in the world calling it good and right. Why is it that we are living in a land today that believes it can change the standards of right and wrong to suit how they feel, rather than measure their lives by what the Bible says? Well, I believe the answer is very simple. We're living in this land today with these activities because God has been rejected. God has been rejected. Now, of course, man is born rejecting God. Man is born in sin. Man is born against God, rejecting God's authority and God's power and God's salvation. But the sad reality is That isn't the problem in our land because man has always been against God. The problem is that God has been rejected not just by sinful man, but by the so-called religion. And I use the word religion of our day, the Christian religion as it is so-called. Sadly to say, within the 1900s, many of the mainstream churches in the United Kingdom have weakened their views on God, their standards of God, They have sought to bring God down to such a level that really they've made him irrelevant in today's society. And that's a very sad thing. I've maybe told you before, but I remember watching on television a debate around the year 2000 when the new millennium was coming in. And I remember a bishop sitting in a television studio 
and saying, of course we know that Jesus didn't do those miracles. Nobody could do those miracles. They were tricks of the imagination. Of course we know that Genesis isn't real. And that is one of the men who's supposed to be the leading lights in the Christian movement in the United Kingdom. And because the church as a whole has rejected the teachings of God and diminished the authority of God, there's no fear of God in the land anymore. There's no right, there's no wrong, there seems to be no absolute. And there is a great attack upon the word of God today. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And what is society trying to do today? They're trying to remove God, not only from now, but also from the beginning. One of the greatest attacks against the gospel, one of the most vicious, horrific attacks from hell against the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the theory of evolution. And let me tell you why. Because if evolution is true, if we just evolved, and there are many different theories what we evolved from, but if we just evolved out of organisms, then that means that God's word isn't true. It means that there is no law that has been broken, and therefore there's no punishment. It means there's no need for a saviour, because there's no right or wrong, because no law has been given. It means that there is no need to be accountable to anyone because if there's no creator, then I'm accountable to nobody. And that's how people are living in this world today. That's a very dangerous thing. If you follow through evolution to its bitter end, it will result in destruction, in chaos in this land. Creation and the word of God and God's standards give us laws. Evolution gives us lawlessness. There is no creator, so who can say what's right or wrong? God's creation gives us marriage as God's standard. Though evolution, there's no call to be married. You can just be immoral because there's no standards. Creation gives us meaning and a purpose in life. Evolution followed through to its better end allows things like abortion and euthanasia to be brought into the land. Because what's a life? As believers, we have been given the full revelation of God in Scripture. And I want you to listen carefully to this. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. There's some people who say, well, surely, you know, God could have used evolution to create the world. That's to say we don't believe the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that includes the very first four words, in the beginning, God. And what does this portion teach us? What does this declare to us? Because this is the foundation of the gospel. This is the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you take away the book of Genesis, if you take away the teachings and doctrines of Genesis, you don't have a gospel. It starts here in Genesis 1, and here is the very first point of the gospel. There is a creator. There is a creator. You are a created being. There is one who has made you. Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And that word heaven and earth simply means universe. God created it all. That word created comes from a word to mean to make something out of nothing. God didn't use what was lying around. God created out of nothing his creation. And not only is there a creator, but you are a created being. You were created and formed in the womb. God knew you before you were known in this world. And you were created by the all-knowing, all-powerful God. But this passage of God's word not only tells that there is a creator who has created us, but that there is a creator who has given us a living soul. If you turn to Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Why is that important? Well, for one, it sets us apart from the rest of God's creation. Animals die. That's it. But when a man's body dies, his soul continues on. 
His soul is something that will never die. In fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7 says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. This body made up of dust will decay, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And you tonight in this meeting possess something that God has given to you, but God will take it back again. And you will stand before God with your soul. And you will give an account to God. Because you see, this teaches us there's a creator that we have a living soul. But it reminds us of something else. That we are under the commandments of God. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying... Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou mayest not, or thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And here Adam, in his relationship with God, even before the fall, was under the authority and the commandments of his creator. God gave Adam laws by which to live. God gave Adam things in which to do. And God has given us his commandments by which we are to live. The word of God is God's instruction to our souls. The truth of this word will set you free from your sin and from your disobedience. You never forget in this meeting tonight, never forget that you have been made by God, You've been given a soul by God, and you're under the commandments of God. You're under the law of God. What God says you must do, or you will pay the consequences and punishment. And as we think of that, of course, speaking to the unsaved, I really was encouraged as a child of God in reading this passage and reminding myself about these wonderful attributes of God. Man really has brought God down so much in his words. But let us lift God up again through the word of Scripture. Let us exalt God through what he claims and declares to be in Scripture. We read this morning in the word of God in Psalm 121, My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. And that ought to be of the greatest encouragement to God's people tonight. We are a needy people. We are a people who often need help. We often need deliverance. And where are we to go for our help? Where are we to go whenever we have a need? We are to go to the one who made heaven and earth. The one who is all powerful. The one who does the supernatural. The one who saves the soul. The one who creates out of nothing. The one who sanctifies. The one who gives strength and power to live in godliness. The one who gives strength to witness for him. There is nothing too difficult for God. Child of God, enter this year knowing that. Nothing too hard for God. Nothing that God cannot do to encourage your soul and to strengthen you in his will. We have a God whose words make a difference. Notice what it says there in verse number three. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke And things happened. And we need as God's people to ever call on the Lord to continue speaking. God spoke light into the darkness. We need to pray God speak light into the dark souls of my friends and of my family. And of those sitting in this church tonight who have no concern about their soul or about eternity or about God or about hell. Lord speak into their hearts tonight. Lord, speak peace into troubled hearts tonight. Oh yes, someone can come and put their arm around you. Say they're praying for you. But oh, what it is when God speaks peace to your soul. When God, through his word, gives you a promise or gives you a comfort. Oh God, speak on, speak peace to thy people in this meeting tonight. God, speak the word of zeal into apathetic Christians. Those who don't care. Those who don't pray, those who aren't careful about holiness or godliness, 
where they go, what they watch, what they say, what they do, what they see. Lord, speak zeal into their hearts tonight. Give the fire that will burn up the dross. Make them clean. Lord, speak wisdom into the heart of God's people. So often, whenever we have to make decisions, we go to people. So often, we have to make choices. We ask the opinions of men. But we have a God who speaks. Speaking God, may God give us wisdom. Thomas Watson, the old Puritan preacher, said, He that made all things with a word, what cannot he do? He can create strength and weakness. He can create a supply of our wants. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Rest on God for this help who made heaven and earth. As the work of creation is a monument of God's power, so it is a great encouragement of our faith. Is your heart hard? He can, with a word, create softness. Is it unclean? He can create purity, creating me a clean heart, O God. Is the church of God low? He can create Jerusalem, a place of praise. There's nothing too hard for my God. We're not living in revival days at present. We're not living in days when people are getting saved by the score. Humanly speaking, God's word asks us as God's people to do the impossible. To preach to dead souls to live. To plead with rebellious hearts to love God. To pray for a change in our town and society. To pray for a baptism of fire within our church. These are not small, these are not small things. They are not natural things. But the God who has called us to do these things can do them. The creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, preach on, pray on, serve on. Because God's will shall be done. And there we see in the beginning God's power. Never diminish God in your thoughts. You can never think too highly of God. But look at what the word of God says. Rest upon it, believe it, and remember this God is your God. If you're saved. Then the second major theme, I believe, that comes within the book of Genesis is, of course, the fall of man. And if we turn over to Genesis chapter 3, yes, we have God's power and creation, but we here we have the fall of man. And while in the beginning reminds us of God's power, the fall of man reminds us of God's purity. Because when man fell in his sin, what a contrast there was between man and God. Man fell away. Man fell into wickedness and rebellion. But God continued to be who he always has been, And thank God he always will be the one without sin. Pure, immutable, and holy. And as I thought about the fall of man, and I thought about Genesis chapter 3, you know what word we could write over Genesis chapter 3? We could write the word destroyed. Destroyed. God made everything pure, and lovely, and beautiful, and pleasing. And wholesome and good. And sin came in. And what did sin do? Did sin make it better? No. Sin destroyed it. Sin wrecked it. And still today, sin destroys. Do you know how much sin destroys? Sin destroys completely. See, we read in the book of Isaiah about the sinful nation of evildoers. But notice that they are the ones who had been Raised by God, nourished by God, brought up as children. And then they rebelled against God, just like Adam and Eve. God took them, Adam and Eve. He nourished them, caused them to grow, to enjoy everything that he had provided. But then they rebelled against God. And as a result, here's what the Lord said. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. And friends, sin destroys. 
Sin has destroyed us. We're born with that nature that is wicked and sinful. Look at the book of Genesis and chapter number 3. Sin destroyed man's purity. Man had nothing between him and God. When God came to speak to him in the cool of the day, he ran to God. He enjoyed being in the presence of God. Why? Because there was purity. There was cleanness. There was a righteousness. But that sin destroyed that purity. Man of peace with God, but sin destroyed that peace. Man of fellowship with God, but sin destroyed that fellowship. Man enjoyed God's creation, but man could never again enjoy God's creation to the degree he enjoyed it before the fall. Because the ground he worked upon and once had full enjoyment in was now a place of toil. It's now a place of toil and hardship and sweat of the bride. And sin always destroys. Sinner in this meeting tonight, sin destroys. And if you continue in your sin, not only will it destroy your life, but it will destroy your soul. Sin ends in hell. Sin ends in eternal separation from God. No matter what's promised, and Satan promised wonderful things to Adam and Eve, no matter what is promised, sin always destroys. And today Satan seeks to destroy. Christian in this meeting tonight, sin destroys. Sin can destroy your testimony. Sin can destroy your fellowship with God. Not your relationship because you can't lose your salvation. But you can be out of fellowship. You can be far from God in a backslidden state. Sin will destroy the unity of the people of God. And because of these things, it's imperative that God's people plead with God, give me clean hands and a pure heart. You have no right to come and seek to be a part of the things of God if there's sin upon your hands. Clean hands and a pure heart. Not only does sin destroy, that sin's work, but look at sin's nature. Because Adam and Eve, who once walked and talked with God, now have a sinful nature. How do we know that? Well, they put themselves first before God. Up until this point, they had obeyed God. Up until this point, they did everything God had said to do. They were obedient, but now they put themselves first, say, we know better than God. We're going to do something that God has told us not to do. We're going to overrule God. And that's the mark of the sinner. Maybe you're in this meeting tonight, and that's the mark of your sinfulness. I know I have to be saved. I know what God's word says, but I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to overrule God. I'm in charge of my life. I'm in charge of my life, little knowing that all the time you're in the bondage of Satan. Not only does sin's nature put self first, but it seeks to cover sin and shame. And maybe you're in this meeting tonight, And you are like Adam and Eve using the fig leaves to cover your nakedness. To cover your shame. And the reality is you're pretending to be a Christian. You're on with Christian people. Maybe your husband or your wife tonight is saved. Or your children are saved. And we watch you come in and out of God's house and the minister even thinks you're saved. But the reality of your heart is that you're simply covering your sin. Not with the righteousness of Christ or with the blood of cleansing, but with religion. Bring that sinfulness. And not only does sin's nature put self first and cover, seek to cover sin and shame, but sin's nature also blames others. And remember what happened? Adam blamed Eve, and he blamed the serpent. 
See, it's always somebody else's fault. And maybe that's exactly your plea before God. I'm not as bad as others. Or I am the way I am because of others. But don't blame me. Every one of us must give an account before the judgment seat of God. And then we see also in this chapter sin's penalty. Pain, hardship and suffering came into the world. Death passed upon all men. There was no death before Adam and Eve sinned. And therefore that takes away the theory of evolution, by the way, because apparently millions of years ago many animals died before man was ever created. Death only came into the world because of sin after men were created. They were under the curse of the law. Death was a reality. The law was broken and separation was their due. Verse 24 of chapter 3 says, God drove man out of the garden and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You see, there was a place at one time there was fellowship with God. A place of perfection, a place of peace, a place of purity. And now there's separation from that. And since that day, we've all been born separated from God. And there's only one way to approach God again, and that is through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the provision upon the cross. That brings us to our third thought, because we've had in the beginning, and that is... God's power and the fall of man, which reminds us of God's purity. But here we have redemption foretold, which speaks to us of God's promises. And here in the book of Genesis, we have promises about the Savior. The very first time that we read of a Savior being promised is found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. And in theological terms, this is called the Proto-Evangel, the first gospel. The first time the gospel is preached. You know where the gospel was first preached? In the Garden of Eden. And God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And then turn over with me to Genesis chapter 3 for a further promise of a Messiah. And in Genesis chapter 3, or sorry, Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 1. Genesis 12 verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house unto a land which I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now how were all families of the earth going to be blessed? They were going to be blessed through the coming of the one who would save them from their sin. It was from Abraham's line that this Messiah was to come. But then further turn to Genesis chapter 21 and verse number 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of thy lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, Abraham had another child. But it was through Isaac that Abraham's seed would continue and from that seed would come Messiah. And then chapter 25 and verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. And it happened, it says there in verse 25, And the first come out red all over like a hairy garment, And they called his name Esau. And technically, he was the one who was the firstborn, through whom the descendant and the line should have passed. But God had chosen Jacob. And through Jacob, 
the Messiah would come. And then there's one more promise, which actually we read this morning in the house of God, and it's found there in Genesis chapter 49 and verse number 10. And it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now to speaking of the time when the Lord Jesus Christ would come and the people would gather unto him. Now Matthew Henry said of this verse in Genesis chapter 49 verse 10, Judah was set out as the royal tribe, the tribe from which Messiah, the prince, should come. Shiloh, that promised seed in whom earth should be blessed, the peaceable, the prosperous one, our saviour, he shall come of Judah. Thus dying Jacob at a great distance saw Christ's day, and it was his comfort and support on his deathbed. Till Christ's coming, Judah possessed authority, but after Christ's crucifixion this was shortened, and according to what Christ foretold, Jerusalem was destroyed, and the Jewish people scattered. Much is said here concerning Judah, which is applied to our Savior. There is plenty in Christ which will nourish and refresh our soul. He is the true vine. Wine is the appointed symbol of his blood, uh, which is for us shed for sinners and applied in faith. And all the blessings of his gospel are wine and milk without honey and without price to every thirsty soul. We are welcomed to him. And if you read down that prophecy of what would happen to Judah, you'll find all those things are contained. Christ was to be born of a woman, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, and from the tribe of Judah. And did that happen? Yes, it did. We don't have time tonight, but you turn to Matthew's gospel and the chapter number one, and you will find that it starts with Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and right down until Christ is born in Bethlehem. And he came through the line of David, And that was of the tribe of Judah. And you'll find that confirmed uh, in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 14. You see, what God promised came to pass. And every promise as we go through the word of God that we see was made about Christ and prophesied about Christ came to pass. Why? Because God's word is true. God's word is sure. God's word is settled in heaven. It is eternal. It does abide forever. A man can seek to burn the book and ban the book, but God's word will be fulfilled. And God will save his people. And God will always have a remnant. Thank the Lord, in the very first book of the Bible, Christ has promised to a sinful people. And then we have, finally, another section of the book of Genesis, and it is the biographical accounts. What do I mean by that? I mean the people, God's people. God's people are presented before us. I have to say one thing that's wonderful about the word of God is that God presents his people as they truly were. You see, we are given their successes and their failures. We're given the high points of their life and the low points of their life. But those who are the people of God are marked by one thing that they all have in common. Oh, so many different backgrounds, many different time eras that they lived in, but there's something that they all had in common if they were the people of God. And it's this, that they were a people of faith. They were a people of faith. A man and woman of boys and girls, if you will be a person of God, if you be a child of God, if you will be saved, then this must mark you too. You must be a person of faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Faith in him alone to save your precious soul. And if you turn with me to the book of Hebrews and the chapter number 11, you will find that seven of these men are identified as heroes of the faith or they're set forward as examples to follow in the faith. Interesting to note that one of the very first things that is mentioned when faith is spoken of in the book of Hebrews in the chapter number 11 is in verse 3, creation. Through faith, verse 3, we understand that the worlds were framed, how? By the word of God. So that things which are seen were made of things which do not appear. Faith that God is creator. 
And here I just want to simply highlight for you these seven men as we bring our meeting to a conclusion. In verse number four, we have Abel. It says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. What are we taught here? Well, we're taught that Abel came God's way. Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. What was the offering? Well, he offered the first thing of the flock. Looking forward by faith to the day that the Lamb of God would come and take away the sins of the world. In other words, he was trusting in Christ, the one who'd been promised. The one who'd been promised to deliver. Abel was trusting in Christ. And there's a very first mark of faith, trusting in Christ for salvation. And then secondly, we see Enoch. And he there, in verse number five, was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And you'll find in the book of Genesis, Enoch walked with God. He pleased God by the way he lived. And in Abel, we find that faith is trusting in Christ for salvation But in Enoch, we find faith is also walking uprightly before God, honoring God by your life, honoring God by your living. You see, faith just doesn't stop, I'm saved, doesn't matter. Faith is, I'm saved, and my faith is going to affect my life. Because what you believe affects what you say, and what you believe dictates what you do. Enoch walked with God. And then Noah, in verse number seven, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Noah did something else by faith. Not only was he saved, not only did he please God by his life, but there was something that he did. He mixed faith with fear. He moved with fear. Why? Because God said that judgment was coming and he moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Now, men and women, we are living in a day where we have the Bible before us. We're closer to eternity than ever. People are dying all around us and we are not doing anything. We need faith that we might move with fear to prepare for our families and our friends and our community, telling them that God's judgment is coming, telling them that they need to be saved. You see, he wasn't willing just to sit back, as it were, and enjoy being a Christian. He worked as a Christian. He made sure everybody knew within his area that they needed to be saved. And then Abraham, in verses 8 to 10, we find that by faith, when he was called to go out in a place which He should afterwards receive for an inheritance obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What do we find here? Abraham obeyed what God called him to do. There's another mark of faith. He followed God's call. And we find also in verse number uh, 10, he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You know what that teaches us? That Abraham didn't live in this world as if he was going to be here forever. He didn't put his roots down here for all time. He was a man who dwelt in tents. He was a man who was exceedingly rich. But he didn't live with an eye to what he could get in this world. He lived with an eye toward the world that was coming. That's faith. Isaac, in verse 18, um, of, well, in verse 18 we read of whom it shall be said that in Isaac thy seed shall be called. And we have read about that already in Genesis. And God had said to Abraham that in Isaac your seed shall continue and from that seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Well, verse number 20 says, and by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And what does that teach us? That Isaac passed on to his children the teachings of the Lord. He told them about the future. He told them what God had shared with him. Again, Jacob there in verse 21, by faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. He witnessed to his family and he worshipped in his final days. He knew he was dying. He knew it a few days before he went home to glory. And you know what he was doing? He was worshipping God wasn't trying to hold on to this world or the life he'd been living. He knew he was going to a better land. That's faith. 
And then Joseph in verse 22, he's the final one of Genesis. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. And Joseph knew that the children of Israel one day were going to come out of Egypt. And he knew where he wanted to be buried. And such a peace he had within his heart that not only did he leave the promises of God with his family, but he planned his funeral, his final resting place. He had a peace about death because he knew where his soul was going to be. And folks, away with this nonsense that I have faith and living like the devil. Nothing of it. Because there are fruits of faith and there are marks of faith. And if you're truly saved, these will be evident in your life. Of course, in some measure, more so than others. But if you're truly saved, these things will be true. You're trusting in Christ. You'll be walking before God. You will have a fear of God. You'll be working for God. You'll be obeying God. You'll be telling others. You'll be passing to your children. You'll witness to your family. You'll have a peace about eternity. These are the result of faith in Christ. And that is what God's word holds forth for us. These men are not supernatural. They were men in this world, flesh and dust, flesh and bone. Human nature, just like ours, they had battles to face, temptations to deal with. There were times they fell and sinned grievously. But they were noted for their faith. And that's the same way men and women are saved today. And as we conclude this brief overview of the book of Genesis, and as you read it, I trust this week in your own private devotions and time. Remember this. Your genesis, your origin, your beginning is that of a sinner. It's that of a sinner. And because of your birth and because of your sinfulness, you need a new soul. You need new desires. You need a new heart. You need a miracle wrought within your life. You need Christ and you need the gospel. And the one who is promised there in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 has defeated Satan and has overcome sin and has the power to deliver you from your bondage and to set you free tonight. You can know for sure that like Abel and Enoch and Noah, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, that you're saved, you're in the redeemed, you're on your way to heaven, that your sins, which were many, are washed away. And that is indeed the gospel. That Christ died for sinners. Final verses I want to turn you to tonight, and with this we're through. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Or 15, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, in the New Testament, 101 times the word gospel is used. And this is the very middle one. 50 times previous to this chapter, 50 times after this chapter. But here's the very central usage of the word gospel, and it is an explanation of what the gospel is. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Now, friend, if you want to be saved tonight, this is the gospel. This is what you need to heed. This is what you need to rest your life upon. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. And verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And here we have the gospel. The one promised in Genesis. Presented into the world. Why? That he might die for our sins. On the cross of Calvary. Christ suffered for sinners. Abel looked forward and claimed the work of Christ as his covering. So did Joseph. So did Noah. So did anybody see it in the Old Testament. And many in this gathering, including myself, have looked back to the cross 
by the eye of faith, we've seen the Savior hanging there, the precious blood that was shed. And we said, Lord, save me, a sinner. And because of the gospel, we're saved. Your beginning is a sinner. How will you end? Maybe you come to this meeting tonight as a sinner. How will you leave? Christ died for your sins according to the scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scripture. Friend, there's a savior able to deliver you from the nature, the bondage, and the penalty of sin. If you will bow the knee and confess, you're a sinner. And claim him as your savior. And tonight you'll have a new beginning. You'll be saved by his grace. If you're in this meeting tonight and you've sat many times before, you've known you needed to be saved, and yet tonight you're still in your sin, I urge you in Christ's name, where you're sitting by your head, call him to save you. I bit the door for a few moments. Please come and say you would like to speak to me. I can show you more if you need to know more about the gospel, but you need to get to Christ. Because he's the only one who can save. God does punish sin. The wicked shall be cut off and sinners be consumed. Flee to Christ tonight for mercy and be saved. Let's pray.